Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. If you ever wondered if we have the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause, how come they're saying under God in the pledge? What's that all about? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America, and then we'll see if we can't figure it out, and then you can leave your droppings down below. Pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all time. That's called Bellamy's Pledge, except for the time part. And Francis Bellamy wrote that back in the 1890s as a Christian utopian socialist. He was a socialist, guys, from upstate New York. His brother Edward Bellamy was a famous socialist writer. So he's writing this for socialistic reasons, not only to create kind of a nationalism, patriotic, we're all in this together kind of thing, but he's not a huge fan of capitalism and he wants to make like poor people and rich people are equal. Even though the word equal isn't there, he wants this unifying sense in public schools that everybody is in this together. So he decides, along with a friend of his, uh, James Upham, that they're gonna get a scheme going. Now, not only to get this pledge into schools and a flag kind of ceremony, but also to sell flags. These guys sold 25,000 flags in 1892, the year they got it done. It's not officially, Congress doesn't make it official, but they got Benjamin Harris at the 1892 Chicago Columbian Exposition Fair to kind of have this ceremony where their manual, the Youth's Companion, became kind of like the official um, a book for public schools in this event, and it was the 400th anniversary of Columbus Day. So it's a big kind of thing, and they sell 25,000 flags, and now schools across the country are buying flags, they're saying the pledge, and they're doing Bellamy's salute, which looks like a Nazi salute. You can see the kids doing it right there. So that's originally how it got into schools, but it's gonna change a little bit. The words first change in uh, the 1920s, there's kind of this new immigration wave, and they decide that just saying kind of uh, my flag might not get the point across if you're coming from another country with a different flag. So they insert the words first uh, uh, the, of the United States and then of America a couple years later. It isn't really until 1942 that Congress decides not only to get rid of Bellamy's salute because of the Nazi thing, but to kind of make it official. And that's when it becomes the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States. So it seriously is in 1942, the first one, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That's it in 1942. You can see that something's missing and that would be the word God. And what's gonna happen is what I'm gonna tell you right now. Louis Albert Bowman. That's right, an attorney from Illinois, a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, is the first one who really tries to make this push to get the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. And he does it at his kind of fraternal organization, inserting the words in 1948 on Lincoln's birthday. And he's actually making the connection between Lincoln because Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address had said that the nation shall under God have a new birth of freedom. And he's taking the word under God from the Gettysburg and he's saying, if it's good enough for Lincoln, it's good enough for the Pledge of Allegiance and he inserts it in there. Although there's some linguists that believe Lincoln's use of the word under God was more of a God willing concept, but he gets it in there. And, and that kind of spreads to the Catholic fraternal organization, the Knights of Columbus, who in 1952 officially take it on in their Pledge of Allegiance, inserting the words and starting to say it and starting to lobby political uh, figures to get behind them. And it didn't get through Congress until 1954 under Dwight Eisenhower. And Dwight Eisenhower had just recently become a Presbyterian. Um, and he's kind of going through a little bit of a religious conversion. And it's in 1954 that he's at the New York Ave Presbyterian Church in New York City near Lincoln's birthday, um, where he's sitting in Lincoln's pew. This is kind of tradition for a lot of presidents to do this. And it's George McPherson Doherty, the minister there, who gives a sermon entitled A Birth of New Freedom, where he makes a direct plea to Eisenhower to put the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance, mainly in the framework of the Cold War, kind of this concept that it can't just be about weapons. God's on our side. We need to all say that, so you need to put it in there. And if you don't believe me, you can actually listen to Eisenhower's words when he kind of signs this bill in order to get the words under God in there. So this is the reason why we did it. From this day forward, the millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town, every village and rural schoolhouse, the dedication of our nation and our people to the Almighty. 
In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which will forever be our country's most powerful resource in peace or in war. Now, that's why it was put in there. You could take the words for what they are, but not everybody agrees that the word should be in there. So we're gonna take a look at some of that right now. So there's only really one Supreme Court ruling that deals with the Pledge of Allegiance in schools. It doesn't deal with the words under God, but in 1943, there is West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, where Jehovah Witnesses were saying, you can't make us say the pledge. This is a free exercise clause thing. We don't believe our religion teaches us not to do pledges and things like that. And the court agrees. And lower courts have ruled you don't even really have to stand that, you know, it doesn't, that it can't be coerced, that it's a voluntary act. Now, when it comes to the words under God, um, there was a case, Elk Grove versus Newdow in 2002, where uh, Newdow is an atheist. He doesn't want his kids saying the words under God. He takes it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, we're going to rule on this not, because you're not the custodial parent. You don't have standing. You don't get to make that decision about your child, so we're not going to really rule on that. But lower courts have ruled, and they've ruled on the side of under God. There's two main arguments. The first one is, is that you know, don't get your pants in a bunch here. It's not really about religion. It's about tradition and heritage. So it's not an establishment clause thing. It's a history curriculum kind of thing. And the other argument being made by the side for under God is saying that it's voluntary, that kids don't have to say it. So if you have a problem, don't say the words under God. And there's no problem at all. Of course, people that are secularists and atheists and constitutionalists who believe that it's a violation of the establishment clause say that making kids you know, think they have to say it, the words under God. What if you're not a monotheist? What if you don't believe in God? That that could unduly kind of influence them. And that's not the state's job. That's the family's job. So those are the arguments. I want to know what you believe under God down below. And thanks for watching Hip Hughes History. We hope you grew your brain a little bit. That's always the purpose. Um, if you haven't subscribed, you can do that right now by clicking the funky red button. You can also go to www.hiphughes.com where the videos are all organized in a nice, neat online sock drawer. And I'll thank you again, guys. We'll see you next time. Hit your press buttons.